Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Allison Alexi, the Director of Undergraduate Studies here at the Center for Japanese Studies and an Associate Professor in the Departments of Asian Languages and Cultures and Women's and Gender Studies. Today, it's my real pleasure to host Dr. Annie Klaus as she shares part of her fascinating research with us. But before I introduce her, let me share a few general announcements. A week from today, on Thursday, November 11th, please join us for the next CJS Noon Lecture. Um, it is entitled Japanese Contemporary Literature, Perspectives and Aporia in the Global 21st Century, given by Cécile Sakai, a professor at Paris University in France. The lecture will start at our usual time, noon on Thursdays. Please join us on Zoom. For future programs scheduled in this series, please check out our CJS events page um, or various social media. And as you might know, attendees' webcams and microphones have been muted but we really would love it if you would ask questions or make comments using the Q&A function during the lecture. And we will present, uh, uh, Dr. Klaus and I will certainly try to address as many questions as possible. So while I was thinking about how to introduce Professor Klaus, I remembered a story I heard about a moment in the 1980s and early 1990s when computers started to become popularly available. As I heard this story, when it seemed like faculty, staff, and students across different fields might start using computers, some computer scientists on a particular campus, not the University of Michigan, got frustrated and a bit territorial. <laughs> Up until that point, computers had been their territory and had belonged to them. And it was frustrating for some of them at least to see computers suddenly become relevant to everyone. I suppose there are lots of possible lessons from this story, but I heard it in relation to environmental and sustainability studies. It feels pretty clear that in the near future, environmental and environment and sustainability will be topics that every scholar and student must engage, no matter their fields or interests. Dr. Andy Klaus gives us a strong and compelling model to follow, especially for Japanese studies. Since her undergraduate work at the University of Iowa, she has been deeply committed to environmental studies, anthropology, and Japanese studies. She holds a master's degree in environmental anthropology from the University of Hawaii and a PhD from Yale, Yale University in anthropology and the School of Environment. She is now an assistant professor of anthropology at American University. On a more personal note, Dr. Klaus and I are both part of Bill Kelly's extended Deshi group, so it's particularly wonderful to get to welcome her to CJS. I believe we might also get to meet Fritz the cat if we're very lucky. Today, Dr. Klaus will give us a taste of her fascinating new book, and I hope some of the stunning photographs she took during her fieldwork. The book is called Drawing the Sea Near, Sato Umi and Coral Reef Conservation in Okinawa, and was published by the University of Minnesota Press. Please join me in welcoming Professor Annie Klaus. Hi, thank you, Allison, for that introduction. This is Fritz's tale. Uh, now that wow. I'm speaking, of course, he'll be interrupting uh, the entire time. So <laughs> yes, <clears throat> it is wonderful to be here. And thank you very much, CJS, for extending the invitation to talk about my research. Uh, of course, I wish I could be in Michigan with you. I have really long wanted to go to Michigan to eat the infamous pastries. I'm not sure where they're made there, but I heard rumor that there is a pastry that has savory stew on one end and sweet pie on the other. And uh, obviously I need to make a pilgrimage at some point to eat that, but given the circumstances of the ongoing pandemic, um, I'm very pleased to be here with you on Zoom. I will keep this a bit shorter than it would be if we were in person because I've learned through trial and error that it can be challenging to maintain focus for an hour uh, on Zoom. Uh, but that just means we'll have a bit more time at the end for some engaged conversation, hopefully. So I wanted to start today by actually showing you a picture from my field work and let me get that up here. Okay. 
Uh, I assume that you can see that. Oh yes, now you can see my screen. Thank you, Zoom, for that notification. Um, okay, so this is a picture from my field work in Okinawa. And I wanna start with this because it kind of helps to frame the work of environmental conservation that I'll discuss in this talk in more detail. What you see here is a snapshot from Sunizu, which is a seashore celebration in Okinawa that happens annually on the third day of the third month in the lunar calendar. That's the day of the longest tide, when the seawater recedes the most. Now, Sunnyza involves the ritualized recognition of reciprocity with gods of the sea. And this is really important for the health of families in coastal villages, in a place where typhoons are really a regular seasonal occurrence, and also where many Okinawans undertake fishing and gathering for subsistence. In my field site, Sanisa starts with the harvesting of fish from a traditional fish pond called an inkachi. The fish are then descaled and gutted by women, like the ones that you see here in this picture. They are affectionately referred to in Okinawa as grandmas or oba. Uh, up on the shore, there were other oba preparing a large pot of celebratory stew made with broad beans and carrots and miso, and the fish would eventually be chucked into that same pot. Kids came from the elementary and middle schools to help observe, uh, to help out and also to observe what was happening. A few of them tried their hand at scaling the fish, got a lot of praise from the Oba for doing that work. And after a few hours of working alongside one another, residents ate the stew and celebrated sunnies on the shore together. <clears throat> This ritual had actually fallen out of practice in this village until recently for a number of reasons that I'll touch on a little bit later. But it was actually a transnational conservation organization that reinvigorated Sunnies in this village. That organization is the World Wild Worldwide Fund for Nature. We call it the World Wildlife Fund in Canada and the US, but in the rest of the world, it's known as the World Wide Fund for Nature. And uh, the organization is often shorted to, uh, shortened to WWF, as I will do for the remainder of this talk. Uh, now, Sunnies is an interesting ritual in and of itself, but I mention it because it's significant for helping us understand how conservation unfolded and actually really needed to unfold in this particular place. The politics of transnational conservation in Japan and particularly in Okinawa are complicated, just as they are in many places around the world. What I think is interesting about this particular event is the negotiations and elisions that lie behind it. So WWF was very invested in making Sunnies happen in the village in spite of the fact that it involved, number one, the harvesting, and number two, the consumption of fish that were caught in what was ostensibly a protected national park in which the seashore is located. They, uh, WWF, that is, supported this event, and they saw it as an important part of their work in marine conservation, which raises the question of why. And uh, it's because during Sunnies, residents acknowledged the symbolic and material significance of the sea. WBF supported this event by providing a lot of infrastructure like cooking supplies and coolers to allow the event to unfold. They helped to organize the fish harvesting and they also paid uh, their staff to support the event. So their support in short was really critical for making the event transpire. But they didn't want to publicize their involvement, however. They didn't put up posters about the event. They didn't publicize it outside of the village. There were no opening comments discussing the significance of marine conservation. Uh, if you've ever been to an NGO event in Japan, you know that these remarks are quite common. There was nothing like that there. The organization was actually just there in a very quiet, albeit significant supporting role. As an outsider organization in this village, WBF really lacked the authority to reinstate rituals like Sunny's. In addition, there was concern that these seascape rituals and events would not be legible as conservation to others that were familiar with the work of the organization elsewhere. I'll come back to these ricocheting uh, effects of the tensions within the organization, uh, because I think they're really significant for considering the future of global conservation. But this event in and of itself is one example of what goes into a more multifaceted approach of the affective, multisensorial, and collaborative form of conservation that eventually unfolded over the course of a decade at WWF's field office in Okinawa. 
So I should emphasize that this is not the initial approach of the organization there. The transformation to this kind of conservation required a few very important commitments on the part of conservationists involving a reconsideration of their positionality, acknowledgement of the hierarchies of knowledge within which environmental knowledge and environmental conservation are produced. And it also demanded a recentering of conservation practices around social equity and solidarity. And this form of conservation and its becoming are really the subject of my book, which you see again here. Uh, <clears throat> I hope it's warming you up. It's cold in DC today as well. Um, okay, so this book really aims to do a few things. One of them is to present an organizational ethnography of a transnational conservation organization, in this case, the World Wildlife Fund. Here, I'm really interested in how these organizations change, what enables them to transform their practices, and what those changed practices really look like through the lens of ethnography. For these reasons, the book diverges from previous ethnographic studies in conservation by focusing in on the conservationists themselves. This framing of my research raises the question, why do these organizations even need to change? Um, you may be familiar with this body of work, uh, but in case you aren't, I'll very quickly outline why scholars have argued that transnational conservation organizations need to change. Um, so the top five transnational conservation organizations, uh, which are, I wonder if you know any of these acronyms, TNC, CI, WBF, WRI, and WCS, uh, they work in nearly every region of the globe. WBF, for example, has primary offices in 40 countries and a smaller presence in an additional 60 others. Together, these organizations employ around 13,000 individuals, and together in 2018, they generated over $2.7 billion in revenue. So they wield enormous political power in many of the countries where they work, and even in places where they don't work, their symbolic capital is high. WBF is the largest transnational conservation organization. And even if you don't work in this realm or you aren't a tree hugger, I would bet that you recognize their logo or have a general sense that they're a conservation organization. Over the past decades, journalists and academics have exposed damaging policies and politics of transnational environmental conservation organizations. They've levied serious charges about a variety of practices, including conservation-induced displacements, torture, and even more recently, murder by those paid by transnational organizations to create and foster environmental conservation. WBF is implicated in all of those charges. Further, and relatedly, it's important to note that these organizations are heavily influenced by U.S. cultural ideas of what ideal nature is and how it should be tended to. So key concepts here are wilderness and protectionism. This is really nature without people, uh, nature that is quote unquote pristine. I call this approach to conservation, conservation far. These underlying ideas uh, about conservation and nature have more often than not led to the alienation of people from places that they have historically been symbolically and materially attached to. So when we think of transnational conservation, it often invokes images of sublime nature, in exotic places, uh, not always exotic places, obviously the Grand Canyon is something that is invoked as well. But uh, we in the United States at least tend to think that those places should really remain distanced from people. I argue in the book that distancing is not just a result of protectionist policies, but it's a reflection of broader distancing logics that underlie the work of these organizations. And we see these distancing logics in the limiting and bounding of sensorial encounters in designated protected areas. We see them too in the creation of what Katya Neves or Jim Igo would refer to as the conservation of spectacle. Nature becomes something to see, not to touch or taste. Some scholars have suggested that the Edenic sciences like conservation biology are marked by anthropophobia, but I would argue that it's not really people here, but it's rather proximity and nearness that are seen as destructive. This intimacy emerges from dwelling or inhabiting or other long-term encounters. Thus, tourists but not residents, scientists but not other harvesters are welcome in national parks and protected areas. <clears throat> 
Conservation FAR, in any case, tends to benefit elites both near and far. And in its implementation of wilderness ideals, it tends towards management that is top down. Despite decades of critique of conservation FAR, it has been really difficult to dislodge it as the dominant global model of conservation. And this brings us to Japan, uh, where, as Donna Haraway notes in her book about primatology, nature as wild does not concern the Japanese in the way it does Euro-Americans. Japan is certainly not the first place that one thinks of when environmental conservation comes up um, because of contentious debates over whaling, among other things. And this actually, I argue, is the reason that we should take a closer look at what transnational conservation looks like in the context of very different nature ideals. Japan is just as industrialized and has just as much financial capital as the United States. So how are transnational conservation values and visions reconciled there as conservation becomes more quote unquote Japanese? In the rest of the talk, I will briefly give you a tour of the arguments in the book before then introducing a little bit of new work uh, that I've recently completed that's related to this book. I have loosely organized the talk around the three themes that you see on the screen here. <clears throat> Cultural ideas about nearness and proximity, marine socio natures and how they develop and dialogue with one another and the significant role of outsiders in the transformations of conservation practice at WWF in Japan. I'll discuss nearness and proximity as they're manifest in WWF's projects in its field station, but the historical contingencies on which these projects rest will only become clear in the second part of the talk where I discuss marine socio-natures. The significance of all of this is addressed in the final portion of my presentation, when I talk about outsiders and transformations. Before I get too far into the talk, however, I should probably say something about my situated perspective on two things. The first one is environmental conservation. <clears throat> so I actually worked as a staff member in the US office of WWF before I went back to school to get my PhD. Uh, I suppose that I should qualify that by saying that I was a very critical and skeptical staff member because I had read a lot of anthropological critiques of the impacts of these organizations before I even took that job. I was one of very few social scientists doing research in the organization and I worked in the science department uh, and a lot of my work actually involved transnational collaborations and most of them in Mozambique. I distinctly remember how the conditions that governed those collaborations made them unequal and infused with very fraught, troubling post-colonial dynamics. And this work experience obviously is not a part of the book, which is about Japan, but it really helped to shape my research questions as well as the relationships that I had with people in my field site. Uh, because of course I did research for this book with the same organization, but this time I was in Okinawa. The second situated perspective that's significant to mention here is that of the book itself and the context of its production. So in my department at American University, there's a strong emphasis on producing public anthropology, by which we mean engaged scholarship. So this book is written for scholars and students of anthropology and Japan and environmental studies, but it's also written for conservation practitioners. I made explicit choices about the book's language and organization and even the academic press uh, with that in mind. So I'd be happy to talk more about some of those choices or trade-offs during the Q&A if that's of interest to you. Okay, so let's move on to head back to Okinawa, which as you probably know, is located in the subtropics. Um, specifically for most of my fieldwork, I was in the East China Sea, as you see here. Uh, it's quite far from mainland Japan and even closer to Taiwan than to the main Okinawan island. My fieldwork was conducted over 18 months, mostly in 2011 and 2012 with some return visits after that. 
Okinawa is interesting because it presents similar fraught post-colonial dynamics that I saw in Mozambique, um, but I also saw some really productive transformations in the WWF office there. And those transformations were contingent, as I'll explain, on the very different cultural and historical conditions of conservation in Japan. The book's narrative really centers on WWF's field station of, of uh, Sangomura, or Coral Village. And at the time of my research, it was the last remaining field station of WWF in Japan. So what was WWF doing with a very small village of 1,600 people? The organization originally came to Shiraho to protest an airport development that was first proposed in 1979. The airport was slated to be built uh, through the landfill practices that we often see in other parts of Japan. And it was to be built right on top of the nearshore coral reef in the area of the sea known in Okinawa as the Ino. That reef, as activists subsequently found, has the largest concentration of blue coral outside of the Great Barrier Reef. And here you can see some pictures of it. Um, the middle picture here is uh, coral that has been damaged by a snorkeler's fin. This is called blue coral because of the color of its insides, as you see here. Um, and this is actually a rare coral that holds scientific interest largely because of how old it is. I need to say a couple of things about this social movement um, in order to situate the, the organization's uh, location there <clears throat> and uh, in Shiraho. And the story about the social movement really unfolds in a fairly typical manner. Um, the movement began with local opposition to the airport plan. But however, it, it really didn't take long for Ishigaki Island to be propelled into the national and prefectural political landscape because of this movement. There were small interest groups that formed across Japan to oppose the airport's construction and eventually transnational conservation groups like the IUCN and the Jacques Cousteau Society, as well as WWF became involved. Scholars have noted that this was one of the first environmental movements in Japan that really leaned on international communities rather than local political parties to advance its interests. As I mentioned, WWF was involved in that struggle. And after encouragement from Prince Philip, who was the head of WWF International at the time, they decided to prioritize opening a field station in Shiraho. They subsequently opened that field station in the year 2000, just as the final airport development plan was being decided. The new airport opened on land north of the village in 2013, and this was an event that was actually mentioned in the New York Times. The success of thwarting the infill, infill of the reef and, and quote unquote saving the sea has been heralded by many worldwide as an example of a successful environmental struggle. Academics and locals alike interpret the involvement of transnational organizations like WBF as significant for the movement's success. However, by the time WWF opened its field station in the year 2000, which again was decades into this struggle, many Shiraho residents just wanted the activists, environmentalists, and outsiders to disappear. This movement had created significant village, uh, divisions in the village. So an example is that for many years, this village of 1600 people actually celebrated two different harvest festivals that were produced by the two different community centers that had emerged out of the pro and anti-airport factions. So WWF not only had a very difficult time implementing the kinds of protectionist conservation that they were accustomed to in Shiraho, they faced an immense amount of ambivalence and animosity for their very presence in the village. Um, and that again was related to the divisions that they had helped to foment um, through participation in the airport, anti-airport struggle. So I call this affective multisensorial approach that I saw evolving over time at WBF field station conservation near. This conservation is actually predicated on different kinds of relationships with surroundings than those that we see in a wilderness ideology. Conservation near is not about distancing people from their environments, that is, but rather it seeks to draw people near. This is, obviously, this is encapsulated in the title of the book. 
So here, touch and taste and smell, in addition to seeing, are really viewed as primary ways in which nature affect forms. So uh, conservation near has some keywords associated with it, and there are things like play, patience, close observation. And these are things that scholars like Hugh Raffles and Anna Singh have written about um, in Japan in the context of ja Japan and Japanese nature relationships before. Conservation near nurtures an ecology of care, not in this paternalistic sense of needing to protect non-humans, rather in a spirit of collaboration and curiosity that promotes socio-natural vitality. So Saniza, the ritual that I mentioned a few slides ago is an example of this because it's an event that seeks to, re to create and recreate the reciprocal relationships that islanders have with their sea. And I'll give another example of conservation near, uh, like the one that you kind of see pictured here in a way that involved seeding giant clams in the near shore sea. So again, I'm arguing that this is conservation near and the nearness that's cultivated here is to past traditions, to gustatory enjoyment, and to the tactile experience of laboring for the clams that you see pictured here. Uh, to contrast this with conservation far, um, I just wanna delineate how eating tends to be approached within that paradigm. Eating would be approached differently in that animals and plants that are considered to be wild tend to be described in conservation far, not as foods, but rather as natural resources. And transgressions of this boundary uh, result in discussions of poach, poaching or bushmeat consumption, which you see um, prevalently in conservation literature. So it often becomes the job of conservationists working this paradigm to really transform eating practices by reframing foods like whale and dolphin into some sort of charismatic species that we watch instead of eat. Um, this project exists really in contrast with those ideas. What you see here, these uh, clams, they're so beautiful, um, brilliant blues and purples and browns. Uh, they're called gira and they are beloved in the village. They are absolutely delicious. Uh, you can eat them raw with a, a squirt of shikwasa. You can also fry them up and snack on them while drinking beer. And um, here you see a picture of the clams being um, planted uh, in the middle picture by some middle school students. They're uh, taking hand tools and going out onto the reef to plant them. Um, you see a picture of, that's the, the inkachi, the traditional fish pond that was built. And you see um, post-harvest put in a cooler and uh, to be shuttled elsewhere to be eaten together. You also see a picture of how tiny the clams are when they're first planted. Um, they uh, are a species that, this is a species that buries itself in rock <clears throat> and they tend to take around five years to reach harvestable size. So uh, what's another thing that I think is interesting about this project is that the clams aren't really of conservation interest. Um, again, environmentalists here are primarily interested in the blue corals and preserving the blue corals. So even though these clams were waning in presence on the reef, they weren't a conservation priority uh, at the outset of the establishment of Coral Village. However, Coral Village did a series of interviews and oral histories with residents and elders and found that these Gita clams really animated villagers, particularly they were animated by the prospect of eating the clams together, um, which is for some historical reasons um, that I could get into later if you're, <clears throat> if you're interested. So Coral Village organized a series of events that involved planting the clams together using, as I mentioned, hand tools, but also power drills. The clams were planted in the near shore sea that you could walk out to and also in parts of the reef where only boats could reach. Conservationists, again, didn't really have much interest in this project overall, but it was one of the most popular projects that WWF undertook. Um, and people collaborated on planting and monitoring the clams over the course of a few years. Part of what made this project successful was the local taste for the clams. Um, I'm sure that many of you in this audience are already familiar with 
uh, Okinawa and its place in Japan. But uh, just in case you are not, I'm going to very quickly mention um, that Okinawa is culturally distinct from the rest of Japan in many ways. It was its own independent nation for centuries, and it had uh, a complicated political status involving both Chinese and Japanese polities. But it wasn't until the 1870s when it was taken over by Japan. And it has long been the poorest and most marginalized prefecture in Japan. Um, you probably know that it suffered during World War II when it became the site for most of Japan's land battles. After the war, of course, it became the property of the United States and it was ruled by USCAR, which is the United States Civil Administration of the Ryukyu Islands. We certainly didn't invest in the people, economy, or infrastructure of Okinawa during the 27 years that we occupied it. And Okinawa remained heavily dominated by the US military even after its quote unquote reversion to Japan in 1972. And this is a situation that continues today. So these conservation dynamics in which representatives of the global north tell people in the global south how they should care for their natures is replicated on a smaller scale in Okinawa, where islanders similarly have long been subjected to the desires and programs of mainlanders. Initial attempts at marine conservation in Okinawa looked a lot like that. Mainlanders telling Okinawans that they should preserve their Ino because of the precious blue corals that live in it. Many Shiroho residents felt that the clam project in contrast indicated that WWF was listening to their interests and had some concern for what they might want, as opposed to this international community who cared about saving the blue corals. For villagers, this project also illustrates a transformation in the conservationists who had, after many fits and starts, finally begun to ask villagers about their seascape. Uh, there are some other interesting tensions that um, emerge in this project about how uh, there's a lack of interest in eating the clams on the part of mainland Japanese. Um, in the mainland, there tends to be um, an idea that these more bright, colorful seafoods that live in subtropical waters aren't as delicious as the more muted colder water seafoods that you find in temperate marine environments. So there are some other compelling tensions that play out in the projects that I could talk more about if there's interest in the time later, uh, if there's time later. Uh, so uh, however, what I think is um, common to this and other projects uh, that were seen as successful by villagers uh, in Shiraho is the commitment on the part of Coral Village to more consensus-based, collaborative, and culturally specific conservation practices. Um, if there's time later, I can talk more about a coral restoration project that I consider to be another example of conservation near. But uh, I, I did promise I wouldn't talk for a whole hour, and so I'm going to move on. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving into the next part of the talk, marine socio-natures. Before I really get into talking about marine socio-natures, I should uh, do a bit of foreshadowing, which is to say that neither this conservation near approach nor the marine socio-natures that I'll discuss now were widely publicized by WBF Japan. Um, and I should say, uh, Technically, both Coral Village and the Tokyo office are considered to be WWF Japan, but I refer to the Tokyo office in this talk as either Tokyo or WWF Japan. There were some tensions between the National WWF office, again, the one that's located in Tokyo, and the field station of Coral Village. And this tension complicated the easy implementation of conservation near. So I'll come back to that in uh, a few minutes, but first we need to learn a little bit more about a Japanese marine socio-nature because the unfolding of conservation near was contingent on it. More pretty pictures of the ocean. Uh, so it's worth noting that anthropology, like many other disciplines, has largely been terrace-centric, 
the ocean and other water worlds may be seen as a backdrop to the rest of life, but it's not really seen as a space that has significance for how people make meaning in their worlds. Um, as I say that there are also a lot of notable exceptions, even beginning in the 1980s with the work of Bonnie McKay, for example, among others. Uh, uh, but also this is rapidly changing to my delight. For a brief period of time last year, there was actually a category for ocean studies books on Duke University Press's website. It's gone now, but it was there, uh, which is great. They're producing a lot of work about the oceans as well. <clears throat> so in the book, I mentioned a quote from Roland Barthes, the French semiotician who talks about the ocean as being devoid of signs, reflecting a view of the ocean as the final frontier as nature through and through without evidence of culture. And of course, this isn't the case, but because of this lacuna, the ocean actually becomes another character in this book presented mostly in interludes where I discuss the ideological material and aesthetic connections of Okinawan Islanders to the sea. And it's within this context that I also discuss in detail the rise of an oceanic socio nature, Sato Umi. Chapter two of the book really takes readers from the Ocean Expo of 1975, which was held in Okinawa, up to contemporary meetings in which conservationists in Japan seek to articulate a Japanese approach to marine conservation. And there I discussed the Japanese term satoumi and how it became what anthropologists like Sarah Besky and Paige West, among others, would call a conservation imaginary. Satoumi, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, is a Japanese word that's made up of two terms, sato means village and umi means sea. It's a cultivated seascape that's actively produced by various human and non-human actors. It's essentially an encultured nature or what some scholars would refer to as a socio nature. Obviously as an anthropologist, I love this term because culture is already encapsulated in it. Other examples of socio-natures are those recognized by indigenous peoples or the, Indo the Indonesian concept of sasi, uh, if you're familiar with either of those. Sato Umi is interesting to me because it's a process-oriented metaphor that bridges and transcends domains that function as opposites within a wilderness paradigm. Like all nature concepts, Sato Umi represents an idealized vision of nature. In spite of rising interest among scholars and practitioners in socio-natures, not much is written about the diversity of socio-nature concepts and the heterogeneous ways in which specific socio-natures are understood and interpreted. Nor has much attention been given to whether those diverse interpretations have significant repercussions for conservation practice. And these are questions that are critical to consider as organizations like UNESCO and the IUCN increasingly endorse such ideas. There are a lot of acronyms in this talk. Uh, that's very appropriate for a talk on environmental conservation. <clears throat> so satomi is interpreted as a traditional Japanese concept, even though it was only coined in the 1990s. In the chapter, I trace the rise of satomi and illustrate how it was actively shaped and reshaped into an idea that was readily identifiable to others as a viable conservation imaginary. Critical to this reshaping was the work of a Canadian expat, Anne MacDonald, who has worked as a writer and environmentalist in Japan for decades. She has written several books in Japanese about nature relationships in Japan. She took inspiration from an idea that was presented originally by Yanagi Tetsuo, a marine biologist. He had observed in his research the declining conditions of the Seto Island Sea and wanted to figure out how to create maximum fisheries potential out of the seas. He approached this problem from a technological standpoint and developed ideas for building a nutrient cycling machine to make the sea more productive for seafoods. He wrote a small pamphlet in English that outlined his ideas. Anne MacDonald saw in this term of Sato Umi an idea that could garner the attention of non-Japanese audiences. And she and others really helped to transform the idea so that it shifted from being an organizing concept for fisheries production into one for marine conservation research and policy development. And the concept surged in interest in the past decade because of its prominence in the international meetings for the Convention on Biological Diversity. They were held in Nagoya in 2010. The deployment of Sato Umi uh, at the CBD meetings was actually something that both Yanagi and McDonald played a large part in. <clears throat> 
McDonald uh, herself did this through the UN University, where she helped to host a conference about Satellunian English. She explicitly sought funding for the conference from the FAO, which is viewed as a prestigious organization in Japan, to, and she did that to ensure that the Japanese government would feel pressure to continue to fund the Satomi projects that it was lukewarm about at that point. Over time, Yanagi's own ideas about Satomi were also reshaped by the conservationist recasting of the term. Um, he told me when I first met him in 2011 that just by being in the sea and using it, fishers are protecting it. If they were gone, he said, there would be no hope for the seas. In the book, I discuss in more detail some of the variations and ideas about what Satomi means and how it can be realized on seascapes. Uh, but this malleability and variability in how the term is interpreted really enables it to appeal to a wide variety of actors, including those who are drawn to it because of its romantic ties to past traditions. And in a couple of definitions of Satomi, you see the word harmonious. Uh, so definitely there's a lot of romanticization happening here. This nature ideal of Satomi is significant to WWF's field station because it legitimated their locally attuned, culturally specific approach. So I would say that this vision of the ocean as Satoumi doesn't necessitate socio-natural conviviality, but it does allow for it. And that was really important for WWF in, in their field station. In Shiraho, for example, the socio-nature of Satoumi was utilized in tandem with a locally developed concept of coral reef culture in order to affect conservation practice. Coral reef culture is essentially an organizing concept that highlights the material and symbolic intertwinement of islanders with their reef. Like Satoumi, this concept of coral reef culture both articulates and describes a specific socio nature as it also makes new objects and agents of conservation work possible. Coral reef culture was elaborated by WWF in collaboration with Shiraho residents, and it was really given similar treatment as their ecological assessments of Shiraho's reef. It's important to note that there are some significant slippages in the way that the idea of Satoumi was ascribed to Okinawa and Okinawans, given the history of the islands. Even though the term arose in the 1990s, it's interpreted to have a deeper history because of the affiliated term for forest called Satoyama, which first appeared in the 1700s. So it's more accurate, I would say, to note that Satoumi was being creatively drawn on by WBF's director in order to further the conservation approach that he found to have potential in Okinawa. Uh, and again, developing these concepts were significant to WBF in Okinawa because it allowed their work to become more legible to others in Japan who had already come to recognize Satoumi as a legitimate conservation imaginary. This brings me to the third set of points about how conservation near unfolded in Okinawa at WWF's field station. Um, <clears throat> and I'll tie together what I've said thus far about the book's themes by relating them to some newly emerging research before I conclude. Uh, so uh, to reiterate the point that I just made, uh, Conservation Near was enabled in Okinawa by the development of this marine socio nature of Sato Umi that legitimated different kinds of conservation practices. And critical, I argue in the book, to the unfolding of these transformations in conservation practice was the work of Yosomono uh, or outsiders, individuals who helped pave the way for those transformations. In the book, we meet people like the expat that I already mentioned who helped redefine what conservation in Japan is for international and also domestic audiences. We also meet a man who could best be described as a coral restoration outlaw. We meet the director of the WBF field station with his unusual commitments to collaborative processes. Um, not all of the people who I write about uh, work for WBF, but in their work, they too help conservation near to unfold there. There's actually a popular theory that circulates in Japan about who the most effective agents of change are, casually referred to as yosomonoron or outsider theory. It suggests that outsiders, yosomono, kids, wakamono, and lunatics, bakamono, are specially endowed with the ability to generate social change. Yosomono, the theory goes, see value in things that, uh, that insiders take for granted. Uh, wakamono kids like to be challenged by new things. 
and lunatics, bakamono, are so invested in their own interests that they're uniquely able to advance their agendas. Yosa Monoron implies that outsiders, kids, and lunatics have a few things in common. And uh, what are those things? Each of these categories of Yosomono is not embedded in mainstream society, a condition that makes them unable to, to read the air, kukyo yomenai, and sense resistance to their change-making ideas. Their outsider status makes them resilient. They're unfazed by opposition that could thwart more socially integrated individuals. And because of their drive, Yosomono can easily bounce back from failure. These traits give Yosomono unique capacities, making them adept reshapers of attitudes and opinions. The director of WWF's field station, the one who was really responsible for enacting the changes there, was an outsider in Okinawa. He's from mainland Japan, um, from Osaka. He also was an outsider within WWF Japan, where he and other staff would de define his outsiderness as relating to his lack of natural science credentials. He was trained as an urban planner, which is a discipline that falls somewhere between social science and development. In conversations with Shiro Shiroho-born residents who were familiar with the work of WWF in the village, they noted that his outsider status was actually critical to him getting work done in the village, even as it also hindered him at times. His outsiderness within WWF was also crucial as it allowed him to think beyond historical practices as well as the structural constraints of the organization. And the transformation that he and dialogue with village residents promoted necessitated reflexivity about the projects of universalizing within which conservation science is oftentimes situated. These emerging conservation practices were ongoing projects and they were far from complete. Uh, and I also critique them in the book, but even in their ongoingness, I, I see that they illustrate the potential for transnational conservation to be more socially and environmentally just. However, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the commitments to conservation near at the field station really existed in tension with the work of the organization writ large. And I found in my field work that there was an appearance of consensus in the organization that it works hard to maintain that doesn't really reflect the way that it works in its various locales. The Tokyo office was more committed to upholding the wilderness image and ideal that they associated with WWF's other offices, primarily the one that's in the US. It's important to note here that the ideas and practices that were linked to Sato Umi really needed to be defended repeatedly by Coral Village staff to other conservation decision makers within and outside of the organization. Because of this lack of support from Tokyo for Sato Umi, Coral Village's director built legitimacy for his approach outside of WWF. He needed others to read and interpret the work that he was doing as conservation and to call it successful in order to maintain his professional status and also to resist the incursion of conservation far projects that the Tokyo office sought to implement. This transformation towards conservation near that is involved uh, what David Moss would call acts of composition. Um, and I saw uh, the director of Coral Village seeking support for his work from other environmentalists as well as government officials. Unsurprisingly, press from organizations that were perceived as prestigious in Japan, including international organizations like the IUCN, the CBD, and the UN. But the most significant attention to Coral Village came from researchers, however. Coral Village's director became part of a national research group looking at Sato Umi and how these initiatives unfolded around the Japanese archipelago. He participated in a research initiative through Kyoto University that brought international scholars together to research how local knowledge is taken up in environmental organizations. One research project that was initiated by a group of scholars at the UN University really legitimated this work on multiple platforms as the research products were published in booklets, again, as an edited volume in English, and in another form as short videos that were dubbed in English and then uploaded to YouTube. So if being sought out by other organizations and researchers counts as a measure of his success, Coral Village's director was remarkably effective. He was regularly sought out by the Ministry of the Environment for his expertise 
And he was also able, uh, critically, to continuously find outside funding for his projects from organizations like the Japan Foundation and Toyota. When there were disjunctures that couldn't be reconciled through acts of composition, rather than abandoning projects that seemed feasible on the island, Coral Village's director found ways to circumvent WBF Tokyo's desires. And I call these acts of circumvention, and they involved sleights of hand and, uh, Interestingly, the creation of additional non-WBF organizations to shelter and support the work of conservation near. Coral Village's director established two separate organizations over the course of a decade during his time there. In these organizations uh, in which he was involved, he told me as a Shiroho resident, became actors that absorbed projects that could not be carried out under WWF Japan's name. These organizations were very legitimate ways through which work could be accomplished in Okinawa, particularly in a small village with other strong community organizations. But they were also a way for the director of WWF's field station to offload a subset of its work while still largely funding or organizing it themselves. That work uh, was offloaded. Uh, the work that was offloaded unsurprisingly was more oriented towards conservation near. Uh, it's also interesting to know that because of the decentralized structure of WBF's network, not all of the work that was undertaken in Coral Village was legible to WWF Tokyo, and this is a circumstance that left considerable room to maneuver within the constraints of other WWFs. So the directors work in these two realms, slowly transforming the overall work plan of Coral Village from conservation far towards conservation near, and creating other organizations through which that work could be accomplished effectively allowed him to carve out space for Satoumi and more consensus-based collaborative conservation projects that drew on localized understandings of the sea. So I have three slides left. Uh, so why is the failure of the Tokyo office to circulate or promote the idea of Satoumi significant? I really wanna take just a quick detour to mention some new research I'm doing that touches on the themes that emerged out of this book project, um, because I think that this resonates uh, far beyond what is happening in, in Ishigaki and in Japan. I recently conducted some interview-based research based on the challenges that I saw unfolding at Coral Village, because I really wanted to see how conservation social scientists in other conservation locations both interpret their work climates and also attempt to make broader changes. Um, and I was particularly interested in the headquarters of transnational conservation organizations. So I spoke with interviewees at five organizations that are well known, um, the headquarters that is of five organizations that are well known, and also uh, perceived as having influence in this realm. And I also spoke to social scientists who work in two funding agencies that these organizations depend on. Uh, um, and this is kind of outside of Japan. <laughs> this is mostly the locations of the organization headquarters are near me in Washington, DC. So uh, there's been a lot of talk in the past two decades about conservation social science and about mainstreaming conservation social science. So uh, to that end, many of these organizations have changed their mission statements and made new claims of integrating social science or more people oriented conservation in the past few years. But individuals who work in these jobs in these institutions note that meaningful change is actually very slow to materialize. So for this research, I took the organization statements about interdisciplinarity seriously, rather than cynically approaching them as merely rhetorical flourishes. Um, and uh, it's worth noting that conservation social scientists remain a tiny minority in these organizations. In one organization known for having a strong social science component, there are five conservation social scientists in the department of 40. And in my research, I found that the form of interdisciplinarity that we see manifesting for conservation social science is largely asymmetrical, wherein a method or a question or an analytical approach could be borrowed from social science, but there's not really a broader sense of co-produced or collaborative projects. Uh, natural scientific approaches really remain dominant within these institutions. So I then look using the lens of expertise at how individuals are engaged in different strategies and practices that they think will enable more symmetrical collaboration. And I note that there are two main ways that this work unfolds. One is through authentication work, 
which is advocating for social science, seeking out their own resources because their organization doesn't enable critical connections to facilitate their social science work. The second is through epistemological maneuvers, um, which essentially involves figuring out modalities that resonate with natural scientists. Um, there are many, many examples of this, but two of them are uh, a conservation social scientist who really represented uh, their research through the methods of medical science rather than uh, what was seen as, as they told me, fluffy social science. Um, another interviewee who uh, ended up after getting a PhD and working for years in their social science discipline, returning to get another master's of science in natural science in order to be able to have some authority with their colleagues. So one intriguing thing about these maneuvers that conservation and social scientists engage in is that a lot of this work is actually hidden labor. And it's both because it can be hidden to institutions who, uh, for whom it's either obscured or obfuscated because they don't require the same labor on the part of natural scientists, but also because it can be hidden to conservation social scientists themselves until after they take their jobs. When they realize that they need to engage in extra epistemological, tactical and practical work to accomplish the social science labor that they were hired to do. Uh, so this brings us back to this question, why is the failure of the Tokyo office to circulate or promote the idea of Satomi significant? And I think the same dynamics that we see at play in the transnational offices are really visible here. And it's interesting because I found that curiously, it wasn't because the Tokyo office didn't recognize different kinds of nature or think that there was one universally appropriate way to do conservation. In fact, I found the Tokyo office was also involved in its own acts of composition and circumvention. Uh, and one very quick example of this is that the familiar English slippage between terms like preservation, conservation, and sustainability appears in Japan too. And I was really curious to know if one of those terms encapsulated Japanese con uh, conservation more than others. So I asked staff members of WWF in Tokyo about those discrepancies. And the difference here that was significant was really between hogo and hozen, in which hogo is often defined as protectionism. I was told that hogo refers to the European meaning, to keep the environment separate from people. And hozen, which we might translate more often as conservation, was defined, as someone told me, as how you learn to live with nature. It's important to note that in WWF's Japanese translation, the term used is hogo. It's called sekai shizen hogo kikin Japan. But staff members told me what they actually do in Japan is hozen. A Tokyo staff member who works with fishery said that the first thing she has to establish when she speaks with someone new is that the name doesn't really describe the work that they do. Everything begins with that discussion of how what they do is actually more like hozen. I found that the WWF Tokyo office was reticent to publicize the work that they did that was associated with Sato Umi because of their perceptions of how the international community would react. So staff members in the Tokyo office really recognized different nature ideals, but they refrained from publicizing them. And while they supported some Sato Umi work domestically, they were reticent to let that work appear in international venues. Okay, I'm bringing my comments to a close. <laughs> so we started with thinking about Sanizu and how it represents a palpable shift from the early work of WWF in rural Ishigaki. That work was again, much more protectionist in its orientation. We discussed how other projects at WWF's field station rested more on affective multi-sensorial encounters and other localized understandings of the seascapes. I argued that this transformation in the field office's practices was contingent on an already circulating ideal for seascapes in Japan, Satomi. I discussed the ways that that term was self-consciously fashioned into a conservation imaginary that was legible to others inside and outside of Japan. And finally, I discussed the ways that this transformation at the field station really depended on acts of composition, as well as what I call acts of circumvention. So on the one hand, my research in WWF's field station of Coral Village demonstrates the possibility of a localized, more innovative form of conservation developing with an institution that really tends to emphasize more formulaic prescriptions. However, these circumstances of layered acts of circumvention that I discussed 
also raise a series of questions about how to create more lasting and more systemic change in these massive uh, transnational conservation networks. And I should mention that uh, my research was funded generously by Fulbright, the National Science Foundation, CAS, and the Tropical Research Institute. Okay. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. I have so many questions, but we've already got some coming in the Q&A, so let's turn to those. And um, the first one is from Marius Pauls. Pauls um, and they're asking for more historical significance of clams, please, <laughs> which is an excellent way to get started. Would you mind? Hi, Marius. Uh, Marius is actually my uh, one of my advisees uh, <laughs> from the University of Norway, um, who's working on some really fascinating research on charismatic uh, megafauna of the dugong in Okinawa and how they are, um, you know, at the center of a really significant environmental movement uh, that involves also the US military on the main Okinawan island. Um, so yeah, I think one thing that's important about in recent memory about the clams is that they uh, have been a part of larger um, Yuimaru celebrations, which are just like, you know, if there's a collaborative work project, someone needs a new roof on their house, for example, or they need to do something to, um, to their uh, yardscape or something. There's like a collaborative work effort and the clams were often served at the end of those work sessions. And so there's a positive gastronomic association with the clams um, that's more recent. Uh, they're also, you know, an amulet, uh, an amulet that is, um, you know, has some symbolic significance. Uh, people kind of have them uh, located around their house. The, their, they, the giant clams, they actually become quite, quite large, um, much larger than your largest IMAX screen could be. Uh, and they, uh, so they were, you know, appropriate basins for water in the past as well. You can't really find the clams that large these days, um, but they have some historical significance that's also attached to their uh, symbolic significance in the village. Thanks, Marius, for the question. Nice to see you here. Thank you for that answer. It's fascinating. Uh, our next question is from Gavin Whitelaw. Gavin, thank you also for being, being here with us. Gavin mm -hmm. says, thank you for today's engaging and rich presentation. Do you see connections between the conservation near approach and citizen scientist developments? Both appear, both appear to, uh, excuse me, both appear decidedly collaborative and affective and have affective aspects and elements? Yeah, great question, Gavin. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot, you know, citizen science also in uh, more participatory conservation approaches. I think we see a lot of similar themes. I uh, The thing that I think that's interesting about conservation near and the way that it developed in this field site is that as one of the marine biologists on the staff at Coral Village explained to me, the entire process of doing a project was quite different from the beginning even. And so um, here Fritz is again, obviously wanted to be a part of this. Uh, <clears throat> so as he explained to me, like his schooling, he had learned to envelop uh, participant participation in his research projects by inviting people to do work through citizen science, like maybe collecting data or helping to monitor a project that he himself had established the boundaries of. And what was different to him about working at Coral Village in this conservation near paradigm was that from the very beginning, like the projects really needed to be determined and decided through collaborative work so that individuals were not really seen as participants, but rather as significant in helping to develop the projects themselves. Um, and so I do see a lot of overlap for sure, uh, but I think um, for some of the people who are involved in these projects who are trained in much more of a, like traditional natural science uh, discipline, they seem to be qualitatively quite different for them. Thank you, that's such a helpful answer. Um, our next question comes from uh, uh, Lisa Paradis, who says, thank you so much for this excellent talk. I'm such a fan. Can I ask how you would differentiate conservation near from what Alpa Shah might have called eco-incarceration? 
This is the idea that, quote, natives become the bearers of alternative ecological futures, oftentimes against their will or at the expense of their own desires for modernity, i.e. Uh, farness distance. Perhaps this has something to do with what you said about mainland Japanese or international communities imposing imperatives to save the blue corals. Did you see any resistance to the conservation near approaches in Ishigaki? At what point does the nearness become intrusive, interfering, or unwanted? That's a really great question, Alyssa. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that, um, you know, certainly there is resistance to conservation in Ishigaki. I definitely don't want to, to present this idea that it was all roses there at all. There was a lot of ambivalence and also resistance to what the organization was attempting to do. And when I saw the organization being successful, it was because they were relinquishing their own sense of what you know, the future needed to look like there. And that involved also, you know, implementing some projects that uh, to me as an anthropologist seemed a bit more fraught, um, that more like surrounded the marketization of marine resources that looked very much to me like uh, the kinds of projects within environmental conservation that are very enveloped in capital uh, capitalism in ways that seem fraught and problematic. <laughs> if you think about like the growth mindset that will be necessary for actually solving our environmental problems. Um, so yeah, I think there's uh, a lot to unpack here, uh, but um, the main resistance to conservation writ large in Ishigaki was, was about um, not only uh, the ways that conservationists attempted to first encroach, uh, and I say encroach very, um, very thoughtfully here, but encroach in the village and attempt to make people kind of submit to their interests, which obviously were much more associated with the blue corals, uh, but also the way that their uh, very presence kind of reminded people of the divisions that were there. And so a lot of what resistance, the resistance was actually tied to more process um, than, than other sorts of things. And so when individuals were starting to be involved much more in the process in substantive and meaningful ways, uh, they, there was less resistance, I would say, but none of this is surprising to anthropologists. I think this is like very obvious from the perspective of anthropologists that this is the way that you do work. Um, so what was interesting to me to see this actually unfolding within this transnational institution that uh, had a pretty terrible track record, has a pretty terrible track record, I would say. It continues to have a, a pretty terrible track rec record around the world, yeah. I don't know if that's a good response to your question, but thank you for it. I think any response that's like, anthropologists know this is very obvious, why are you <laughs> doing it in such a silly way, is a great answer. <laughs> um, so I had a question myself, which is combining or trying to combine two of the elements that I found most fascinating in your talk, which of which of course there are lots. Um, so the first is, is this idea that potentially the way to facilitate, let's call it sustainable conservation is to make things delicious um, or attractive or engaging, right? So that that's part of what I was hearing you say, at least as a proposal that some people are like, well, if we make people want to eat these clams, um, maybe that's actually a way to keep the clams sustainable or something like that. And I was wondering if it would be at all possible to pair that with the very brief mention you had at the beginning of your presentation um, about your efforts and your department's efforts to uh, write for the public. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to write anything, I think, but it's especially hard to write for multiple audiences, especially if some of them are more or less knowledgeable, uh, use different vocabulary, all of that. So I was wondering about, um, since the, the simplest question is, would you mind talking a little bit more about the choices you made, the tensions you felt as an author and as a researcher to produce a work that could be, I think I wanna say consumable <laughs> by multiple different audiences. And the second part of the question is, does that idea of making something so delicious that we all want to sustain it have anything at all possibly to do with um, thinking about public scholarship? Interesting questions, Allison. Thank you for those. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 
very challenging to write a book, as you know, that can satisfy multiple audiences. I mean, one thing that I really was trying to do in writing a book that is, is like, I think from an anthropological perspective, very like relatively jargon free um, is, uh, is just that, um, you know, uh, it's hard. I think it's harder to talk about these concepts in ways that have uh, more purchase outside of academic circles. And so I definitely struggled with that in writing this book, but it's, it was really important to me because I think one thing that I see in the anthropology of conservation is uh, a lot of critical scholarship that's really important and significant and has, I think, helped to change the practices of these organizations. But we don't really see examples of what we think is more socially just or environmentally just or has some sort of promise. And so I tried to um, write the book in a way that was speaking to some of those interests of my own, which are actually about producing scholarship that also has some elements of, of um, you know, writing out the future that we wanna see in them. And I see that in the work of scholars like JK Gibson Graham, and the work of Anna Singh and the work of Laura Ogden among others. Uh, so yes, uh, that was important to me. It was tricky to do. One way I tried to actually do it was by um, inserting some of the things that I thought were really important to painting a picture of Ishigaki and what it's like to live there and be there and to be in the ocean there. And uh, I put those in as interstitial chapters in the book that are, you know, there's really not analysis tied to them, but they're there to be descriptive uh, as well as to kind of nod to some of these material and ideological engagements of islanders with the sea. Uh, the second part of the question is unanswerable, Allison. What a great question though. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, I am trying to make this book consumable for sure. I, you know, there's also on the other hand, if we think about Satoumi and what it actually is telling us um, about the ways that we can interact in the sea, it's really focused on nearshore spaces. It's, uh, it's like coastal environments. And so a lot of the debates that we um, see Japanese environmentalism kind of most significant, significantly entering into when it comes to marine spaces, they're just not, they're not really relevant in this conceptualization of what marine conservation should be because it's small scale, it's local, it's not deep sea fishing or depopulating of bluefin tuna. Those things aren't really relevant to this conceptualization of what conservation is and should be. And so that's problematic. I mean, that's just problematic. Um, consumption is a massive issue when it comes to marine environments in Japan. And uh, there isn't a huge amount of awareness on the part of Japanese consumers about sustainable seafood. And so these are big issues. Actually, my next project is looking at that. So I think there are significant issues that I want to spend some time thinking more about. Thank you. I wasn't trying to ask an impossible question. I was <laughs> I was thinking like quite narcissistically about how if I have something like perfume that I like, I try not to use it. And then I have these moments where I'm like, hey, you're going to die one day. You should probably use this perfume before it's like before your life is over. Um, and so like the tension that I personally feel on a very different <laughs> level about like, what am I saving this for? Right. Um, and how does use and enjoyment relate to to all of that? So. Apologies, I wasn't I wasn't trying to ask a ridiculous question, <laughs> although I kind of always do. Um, so just as a reminder to our audience, please do um, ask any questions or share any comments or feedback in the Q&A. Um, so we have a, a question from our own um, Robin Griffin. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, so Robin says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I found the contrast between conservation near and far to be incredibly illuminating, especially with all of us being cooped up at home over the last couple of years, absolutely. On the topic of citizen science and affective aspects to con conservation in the US, I feel like there has been a stronger romanticization and push to quote, get back to nature during the pandemic with more people engaging in outdoor activities. This might be outside your book's focus, but I'm wondering if there was a similar shift from Japanese citizens to engage with nature directly and have become more interested in conservation efforts as a result of the pandemic. Uh, 
Gosh, I love that question. I wish I could answer it. I am just really just itching to get back to Japan. So I don't know. Um, I mean, I did follow obviously in my field site to see um, mostly illness numbers and um, hospitalizations. There's only one hospital in all of Yayama. It's on Ishigaki Island. And so I was very concerned to see how people were doing uh, during the pandemic. Uh, for those reasons, also a lot of the people who I worked with for my field work were elderly, um, all of the Oba who took good care of me and let me tag along while they collected seaweeds and whatnot from the sea. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I wonder, um, my, uh, I don't know. I wonder if anyone in the audience has recently been to Japan. I was supposed to go last summer and the summer before, and I just can't go. My university won't allow it. And also there are some complications, um, on the Japanese side as well with doing research right now. Um, but yeah, I definitely saw a lot of interest in, in DC uh, with more promotion of, of, I guess, support for public spaces. We have a lot of sidewalk cafes now. People definitely spend a lot of time outside in our parks. Um, we have the benefit of Rock Creek Park here, which is this amazing urban oasis. And uh, it was full of people who were trying to escape their teeny tiny apartments and houses. Uh, not that I'm speaking from personal experience or anything there. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you're also raising a question, Robin, about kind of what comes out of, out of this uh, pandemic when it comes to environmental issues. I think significantly though, you know, so much of the conversation even within, um, conservation circles about the pandemic were more about how there's reduced funding because of public health concerns now being much more important. So uh, there's a lot of concern within transnational organizations. They wouldn't be able to fund the projects that they uh, normally do because of reduced funding from organizations like USAID, among others. Uh, so yeah, I don't, that's kind of a rambling answer to your question. <laughs> It's it's a great answer and it's such a great question from Robin. I was also thinking, um, I don't know if how you've been feeling about this, but it feels very strange to be an in my case, in our case, an anthropologist of Japan. I haven't been in Japan now for for more than two years. Um, it, it, I'm starting to feel false. It's not quite imposter syndrome or something like that, but it, it's just starting to feel absurd. And you know, me going to Japan to see people I care about and like check in. Um, is not a legitimate reason, like this is not a priority and it shouldn't be, but um, there is something about, um, as someone who's not a citizen, right, and doesn't need to be there really, um, just not being able to get to Japan, um, it feels it feels really bad. Yeah, it's really destabilizing and I find myself doing strange things. You know, I'm still in good contact with people, uh, obviously through line and, and other uh, ways of communicating, but still I find myself like watching the silliest Netflix, the Netflix show from Japan because I just want to be immersed in a way. And uh, yeah, it is very jarring to not be able to go, obviously uh, important also to kind of be doing all the things we've been doing, but I agree, Allison. Yeah. yeah. So I have a couple questions myself. I, I do want to remind our audience that you're most welcome to ask your own questions too. I don't want this to just be about, about me and my ideas. Um, I would love to hear about your next project as much as you'd like to share. Um, it sounds fascinating. Um, would, would you mind? Is, is that too, um, is it too early? Is it not yet ready to share? No, I am still at the stage of applying for funding to do the project, and I'd be happy to talk about it. Maybe you can give me some great ideas that will um, uh, inspire me in new ways. Uh, the project is really thinking more about seafood and sustainable seafood. And one thing that I've noticed in thinking more about some ideas that actually emerged from the book that are related to gastronomic issues. And I just found that uh, when it comes to thinking about the sea in Japan, a lot of people are thinking about their stomachs. And so uh, thinking more specifically about how seafood sustainability is enacted by activists, as well as by individuals um, is something that I'm really interested in spending more time thinking about. So the project is, uh, I propose to actually focus much more on um, how sustainability is kind of shaped and enacted through different activist campaigns and also through 
uh, through things like eco labeling. I'm sure you're familiar with like MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, but also there's there are different certification schemes in Japan as well, and kind of thinking through how those are presented to publics in Japan and the kinds of work that activists and seafood advocates are putting into to designing those things that are basically like shortcuts for helping people understand, um, you know, which things, which practices they can engage in that will be more environmentally friendly. But I'm, what I'm really interested in is actually cooks because uh, I think that cooks are kind of the missing link in thinking about sustainable seafood initiatives. Like we have actually a lot of scholarship about fishers and about production. I spent a lot of time working with fishers uh, for this project. And we also have a lot of scholarship about the consumption side, the people who are sitting and eating these foods in restaurants, but <clears throat> not as much as written actually about the cooks and the practices that they are engaged in. And so I'm hoping to think more about these issues in relation to ideas of substitution. Um, and that's kind of the theoretical lens that I'm hoping to approach the project through. So if you are a cook, like how do you navigate all of these different practices that are, um, you know, that, that help you cook sustainably, like you need to know actually a lot about the production of a fish in order to be able to make the right sourcing choices. So I see myself being in markets as well as grocery stores, um, helping people as they choose which seafoods to purchase. And then also spending time with them in their kitchens as they cook them up and kind of figure out the different uh, ways that they can, you know, use certain techniques or use certain technologies to help cook up uh, sustainable seafoods for the people who they're cooking. So that, that would involve both, I think, household cooks um, as well as chefs. And uh, the focus um, in restaurants is more on people who purport to uh, serve sustainable seafoods. There's a really great organization in Tokyo that is pulling together a group of chefs. It's called Chefs for the Blue. And uh, their, uh, their chefs are all involved in sustainable seafood um, sourcing. Uh, but for household cooks, I think the question is more about seafoods writ large, you know, how they're making some of those decisions about foods to which foods to source. And of course, all of this is much more significant in thinking through post Fukushima practices as well. Um, you know, I think people, uh, at least the people who I am connected with in Tokyo became much more interested in thinking about seafood sourcing after Fukushima. Um, and, and obviously there's some great scholarship written by um, Aya Kimura as well as uh, Nico Sternstorff Cisterna about some of those, um, some of the more co-op oriented um, outcomes that, uh, you know, were produced by Fukushima as well. That sounds like such a fascinating project. Um, and I feel like based at least on what I've noticed at the University of Michigan, lots and lots and lots of people are especially interested in thinking about food critically now. Um, so it feels like that would be such a productive and extraordinarily, um, you know, popular um, in, uh, space to enter the intersection of conserv um, conservation and food studies. It sounds, first of all, really real. Like when you say that, I was like, oh yeah, it's true. I am make, trying to make responsible decisions. And also sometimes I'm just really tired and really hungry <laughs> trying to get what I need. Yeah. Um, so uh, Professor Claus, thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. There's one more question that just came in. Um, uh, so Marius asks, can you talk to us a bit more about the hierarchies of understanding and practice within different branches of these large conservation NGOs and how you went about accessing those different understandings? Um, uh, Marius is selfishly interested as really similar patterns appear where they work in Eastern Indonesia. Sure, yeah, hierarchies of understanding and practice within different branches of these large conservation NGOs. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this. It looks like it's actually Florence, Marius's postdoc who's hijacked his account. Um, thank you for that question, Florence. Uh, yeah, I think that it was really interesting to me to see that for conservationists who work in WWF in Japan, they saw a lot of differences within the organization. So if you're at the headquarters in uh, in well, it's kind of complicated because the WF International is actually located in Europe, in Switzerland, uh, but the US office does a lot 
um, helps to manage the international projects as well. And so there are kind of two headquarters, I guess you could say, but people who sit in the headquarters in DC see themselves as uh, somehow like you know, almost neutral in, in this world. Um, and that's not surprising, I guess, uh, given their dominance, I guess, in the overall structure. But definitely in Japan, I saw people noticing a lot of differences in the way that they um, understood their connections to other other branches of the organization. So they saw a lot of differences that they described as east-west differences in understanding. Um, other times they would describe these differences in orientation as more relating to uh, the prevalence of uh, indigenous approaches to conservation within different branches. And so within WWF Japan, uh, at least at Coral Village, people saw themselves as aligned much more with offices in Indonesia, for example, or in uh, South America, where two places that were pretty regularly uh, mentioned as having significant uh, likenesses to the approaches of WWF in Japan. Um, it's a really interesting organizational model. And obviously I could talk a lot more <laughs> about the model because I think it's fascinating. I think there are a lot of um, strengths in the network model that they have. They have, obviously they have a huge amount of political capital and they're able to actually amass a lot of financial capital as well, which is significant for effecting change around the world. Um, I think there are also a lot of uh, challenges to this organizational model in, in the ways that I described in the talk. You know, there's a very dominant idea, uh, even in places where wilderness ideals aren't uh, prevalent. There is this idea that that's kind of what the organization is about. And um, you know, I'm mean, that's part of part of that's encapsulated in the name in the US, we call it the World Wildlife Fund still. Uh, and that's a pretty accurate, I think, assessment of the ways that people in other areas of the network see the US. Um, but these dynamics become pretty complicated because different national offices also fund research in other places. So this isn't really uh, something that happens in Japan as much, but in the Mozambique office, for example, they get funding from various national offices of the organization, and that helps to kind of shape the work that they do and the work that they're able to do, um, which can be problematic. For sure. <clears throat> oh my gosh, it's 1.30. <laughs> yes, we have to end, unfortunately. Um, Florence, let me really apologize. I'm sorry I didn't give you credit for your excellent question, but thank you so much for that. Um, and and Annie for Husser Klaus, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for being in the audience. It's been a joy. Um, and we look forward to seeing you a week from today at noon uh, for the next, next talk. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Allison. Bye.